Shall I start? Okay, so, um, well, good morning. Um, first of all, I just want to make a small apology for the fact that, uh, as you might hear, uh, the sound over here, uh, my, my computer is, is dying. And, uh, well, I trying my best to resist, uh, sorry, um, to resist uh, the, um, the, the fact that I have to buy a new computer. Uh, but, so it's six years old, which I think is a, is a record for, but, um, uh, sorry, I have to. Um, so I, I apologize if something happened we, uh, during my, my lecture. Um, first of all, uh, welcome for, for this uh, seminar, which uh, as you might know from the program, um, attempts to address, uh, uh, let's say, the development of, of architectural theory uh, from uh, Vitruvius to the 20th century uh, by specifically commenting uh, uh, canonical texts that have in fact uh, identified this uh, development. But uh, of course, uh, there is a lot of literature on this uh, particular topic. Uh, so uh, I think you have a lot of possibilities to deepen much more uh, this particular, let's say, subject. Uh, but um, what I would like to do in this seminar is to link uh, this canonical text not only within the Rome discourse, which is of course uh, architecture and eventually town planning, uh, but I would like to connect uh, these books to the particular context, both social and political context in which these uh, uh, texts were uh, written, which is something that uh, one often can uh, uh, read uh, in very specific commentaries of these books, but it's not always an obvious, uh, let's say, angle uh, through which to read this, uh, these books. I would like to, uh, let's say, summarize this particular point of view uh, with the Greek word uh, ethos, uh, which is in my work, in my research, is a very important uh, keyword, uh, uh, a word that can roughly translate in English as character. Uh, ethos uh, uh, is the character of a given society or a given civilization. The, the customs, the habits uh, that uh, constitute the social and political fabric of a particular period or of a particular, let's say, uh, society. And it's precisely in the ethos uh, that uh, politics uh, reach its utmost, let's say, um, manifestation. So we are very often to see politics in the form of particular symbolic events or in the, in the form of particular symbolic figures or references, but it's uh, much more difficult to recognize politics in the ethos that construct the habits and the customs of, the, of which we are uh, part. And I have to say that especially uh, today, especially in the 21st century, politics has to do more with uh, ethos, with the way actually we, uh, in the everyday, we relate to each other than with the representation of politics, which of course we increasingly perceive as something that is uh, outside of our current uh, and more daily preoccupations. Now, I would like to address uh, the problem of architectural theory precisely from this uh, point of view, which is, if you want, more related to our contemporary understanding of politics as, as ethos. Um, of course, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, clarity, uh, I organized the material in a very traditional and if you want also very rudimental way by selecting a series of books and presenting them uh, chronologically. So uh, it was uh, very, uh, I have to say, obvious uh, to start with uh, Vitruvius, uh, the Architectura, uh, because actually uh, it's uh, perhaps not the first uh, book or the first text that deals with, with architecture as a specific uh, form of knowledge, uh, 
but uh, for sure is the first systematic uh, book uh, that address uh, architecture and is of course, as you might all know, uh, the only text that has survived from antiquity that uh, deals directly uh, with architecture. So uh, Vitruvius, whether we like him or not, uh, is the founding father of our discipline. I mean, he's not, of course, the father of architecture as a practice which existed much long before Vitruvius. Vitruvius actually is what has emancipated architecture from the practice, let's say, of building to a form of reasoning, a form of knowledge. And this is exactly what is the ambition of the text that Vitruvius uh, wrote uh, in the 20s, uh, called the Architettura Libri Decem, the 10 books on architecture, which really had uh, the ambition to systematize in an almost uh, encyclopedic fashion uh, the knowledge of architecture. And in fact, we can say that uh, we can blame, as many, many uh, architects and researchers have done, Vitruvius to not be really uh, the most fashionable architects. Uh, he, his references are perhaps already at that time he was writing the book quite uh, old. Uh, of course, we can blame Vitruvius to be a very obscure writer at time, especially when he has to deal with technical problems. Um, Alberti, who has written perhaps the most uh, uh, ferocious uh, <laughs> critique of Vitruvius in uh, his uh, attempt to write the 10 books on architecture, De Figadoria, claimed that uh, it was better that Vitruvius had never written a book on architecture, uh, because actually instead of clarifying this, he had made even things more uh, confused. But we have to praise Vitruvius for one thing, which I think is very important, uh, and it's precisely his attempt to treat architecture in a radically systematic way. So Vitruvius has really the ambition to uh, address a subject that at that time was, as a, as a knowledge, not as a practice, was pretty much confused. I mean, it was, of course, dealt by very important, uh, uh, let's say, thinkers like Cicero, uh, Varro, who might have the person that has almost invented or made uh, known the term architecture itself. But it was never the subject of a systematic study. And there is an impetus uh, in Vitruvius' style of addressing architecture that is clearly uh, encyclopedic. And in fact, Vitruvius is one of the first uh, writers uh, to really uh, clearly adopt uh, in a very, let's say, radical uh, way this uh, approach to knowledge, which in fact makes uh, the architecture not only interesting for architecture itself, but really as a sort of uh, uh, attempt to systematize uh, knowledge uh, from, of course, the point of view of, of building uh, and, and constructing uh, a place. Uh, and in fact, it's very important to understand, sorry, it's very important to understand uh, uh, the architettura within the concept, the Greek concept of enchilios uh, paideia, uh, which is exactly the etymological roots of encyc encyclopedia. Uh, the idea of constructing a text that would be read uh, as a general course uh, on a particular, uh, let's say, uh, set of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, and is exactly what uh, is the very form of uh, the architettura. I mean, the architettura really has this uh, overall encompassing uh, architecture in itself as, as a book, not only for actually the, the subject it. Uh, uh, transmits. Now, uh, this is a very important aspect which I will later on develop and explain why uh, Vitruvius actually felt the urgency to deal uh, with architecture not in an occasional fragmentary way but in such a systematic fashion. Uh, for now, I would like to uh, uh, show you actually uh, the, the, very architecture, the very architecture of the book as an object. This actually how at Vitruvius times the architettura appeared uh, in the reconstruction made uh, by Indra Cages McEwen, who has written for me one of the most interesting study on uh, Vitruvius, uh, Riding the Body of Architecture, which I strongly recommend you to read as a, after my rather rudimental uh, introduction. She's actually had uh, made a reconstruction um, of the, the way actually the, the books uh, were organized. Uh, Ten books uh, uh, has a very specific uh, meaning. Ten, as Vitruvius also described uh, in his book, is a perfect number. Um, it's, it's a number that has a symmetry. Uh, 
uh, in itself. And symmetry, as we will see, is a fundamental concept uh, in Vitruvius' idea of architecture, but also idea of the world. Uh, and for him, is a fundamental instrument to organize things, to give things a cohesive uh, body. Uh, uh, body is a word that uh, Vitruvius stress uh, obsessively uh, in his book, Corpus, uh, uh, which in fact is the fundamental metaphor through which, or if you want analogy, through which actually understand architecture, not as a set of fragmentary, uh, let's say, uh, things, but really as a body, as something that has a fundamental symmetry, like the, the human body, and therefore, through this symmetry, it organizes uh, the whole knowledge that we have uh, of the world. And what is interesting uh, is that the appearance itself of the object uh, the, the, each book, of course, was written in a scroll, and the way actually the scrolls are presented, uh, it clearly um, emphasized the concept of symmetry by almost uh, resembling a pediment, which, uh, as you will uh, Vitruvio stress, in architecture is one of the fundamental archetypes of symmetry. This is very important in, for all the uh, books that we will uh, uh, read uh, in, in architecture, but I would say in general, uh, a book uh, should not only be read, but should also be seen. Uh, the book itself is, is an object, uh, is, is, is a form, uh, which cannot be detached from its content. I mean, one of the fundamental mistakes in reading a book is to disconnect the body of the book uh, from, from its, uh, let's say, uh, content. And in Vitruvius, this is actually very important because as you see, the very presentation of these 10 books stress this uh, sort of symmetry, harmony, between the different subjects, which of course, in Vitruvius, as we'll see, has no a sort of innocent uh, meaning. It's precisely this harmony that, in our own terms, we can almost uh, translate as a sort of overreaching apparatus uh, that is the very political and cultural significance of Vitruvius' attempt to systematize architectural knowledge. Now, of course, uh, we have to immediately, as when we read uh, every book, uh, go through the list of uh, contents. Um, you see uh, how uh, you know, efficiently Vitruvius is able to cover, distribute what uh, he uh, thought were the main uh, topics, the main subjects of uh, an architect uh, expertise. Uh, of course, starting with a very let's say, uh, basic uh, place uh, of architecture, which is the layout of uh, cities, uh, a practice that uh, in Roman times was of fundamental importance because to found a city, define the start, let's say a city was uh, starting a civilization, starting basically the very ethos of, 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 a, popu of a people that were uh, conquered uh, by the Romans. The Romans really gave to the, the act of foundation uh, which was a very uh, complex uh, ritual, a fundamental importance, and therefore the design of cities was not just the design of uh, infrastructure or of, let's say, the pragmatic needs of a certain place, but it was really the ritual of defining the ethos of a particular civilization, and therefore for Vitruvius is the very beginning of uh, architectural uh, expertise. Of course, after that, uh, he explained building materials, but the most interesting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, one of the most interesting aspect of uh, the Architettura that uh, Vitruvius, uh, and we will see later why, devotes uh, two chapters out of ten to temples, uh, the uh, third and the fourth. Uh, uh, in the third, actually, uh, and the fourth, uh, the, the, uh, the most uh, influential uh, item of, Vitruvius, of Vitruvian theory, especially for Renaissance, is uh, treated, the, the, the orders, what actually later on would be called orders, which Vitruvius called uh, types. Uh, and this is actually, again, a very interesting aspect. It's not obvious to, uh, uh, let's say, devote out of uh, 10 books, uh, two books entirely on a specific uh, building, which we will see later has a very strategic importance in the time where Vitruvius was writing uh, the Architettura. Of course, public building, private building, finishing, I mean, the way actually things are ornamented and, and, and let's say, uh, made uh, inhabitable, uh, where in fact, what is interesting that uh, Vitruvius uh, seems to uh, ignore uh, fundamental uh, aspects 
of, that already at that time in Roman architecture were very important, like for example, vaulting, uh, which is exactly what, uh, what characterized Roman architecture vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, uh, Greek architecture. So this is something that has uh, always made uh, critics and historians on Vitruvius think that, of course, he has a very uh, retrograde and old-fashioned outlook on architecture. Water, of course, a uh, fundamental uh, element that for Vitruvius together with fire constitute the very uh, origin of uh, settling uh, a place. And then one of the two most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, curious uh, books that in fact made Vitruvius' uh, approach to architecture very unique also compared uh, especially to what architectural theory we deal with uh, later. Uh, sundials and clocks, which, uh, as we'll see later, play a very important role, again, in the context in which uh, Vitruvius is writing the Architettura, but it's something that is not, was not obvious, that was supposed to be part of the knowledge of uh, an architect. And, of course, machines, especially war machines. Vitruvius happened to live, uh, uh, especially at the beginning of his career, in a very special uh, moments of the history of ancient Rome, where, of course, conflict and war uh, was a fundamental, let's say, uh, event. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's uh, known that Vitruvius uh, had served as a soldier uh, together with Caesar, and therefore he had the uh, direct responsibility in the construction of uh, war uh, machines, uh, especially ballistas and catap catapults, uh, which, of course, uh, um, in the then book, uh, and it's very interesting that Vitruvius finished the Architettura with uh, such a book, a book on warfare, uh, basically with very, very interesting uh, anecdotes, one of which is really the concluding remark of the book, and I will explain you uh, at the end. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, the Architettura really ends with these two uh, expertise, which, of course, projects architecture far beyond the scope of edificatio, and of course, uh, understand architecture within the paradigm of machinatio, of machining things, of machining of, of something that is no longer static, but something that has to do with movement and with a very specific, uh, let's say, goal of governing and fighting uh, uh, within, let's say, a very unstable uh, social context. So in, that's very interesting, because on one hand we have this strong attempts towards unity and a cohesive uh, framework through which, uh, of which architecture has to be the supreme uh, metaphor. But at the same time, Vitruvius also shows how an aspect of that supreme, uh, uh, let's say, stability is precisely instability, danger, those conditions that characterize precisely the events that uh, uh, Vitruvius uh, uh, describe uh, at the very end of uh, uh, the Architectura. I would like now to go through a series of keywords uh, which uh, Vitruvius introduced, especially in the introduction. I mean, Vitruvius has a very, um, he was actually a, a typical style of organizing uh, textbooks, uh, which was to have for each chapter a preface, an introduction, usually the most enjoyable part of the book. And then he would actually, with a series of chapters, deal with more technical issues. And what is interesting about the preface uh, is that they are not uh, immediately uh, introducing the particular topic of each book. Uh, there are usually a general discussion about architecture, so you can almost take all the preface of the books and you will have a kind of general dissertation on, on the meaning of architecture uh, itself. Uh, of course, the most important uh, uh, part is the introduction, where uh, Vitruvius, of course, address uh, the Emperor uh, Augustus. Uh, we will see later how this addressing is the very meaning of why Vitruvius uh, uh, brought uh, the Architettura. And, of course, he introduced a series of words, uh, which is very interesting because uh, already at that time, uh, architecture is uh, understood not just as a matter of building, but really as a matter of communication. Of, of, of communicating, transmitting something. And in fact, the first uh, uh, lexical almost clarification that uh, Vitruvius introduced is the difference between signified and signifier. Uh, signified, of course, is the object of inquiry, architecture itself as a, as a building, as a space. Uh, but for Vitruvius, it's also important the role of signifier, 
he really used these uh, words, uh, of course, in, uh, in Latin, which is the terminology that one needs to conduct a proper discussion. So Vitruvius stressed from the very beginning there is no architecture uh, if it's not something that we can speak about. So if there is no a terminology, if we, there is no a, a sort of uh, 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 language uh, framework, architecture itself cannot uh, exist. Uh, another set of uh, uh, concepts uh, which are very important to understand the very, uh, let's say, uh, object of uh, the architettura is the distinction that uh, Vitruvius made between the concept of fabrica, which is exactly what existed before architecture, the practice of building, which anybody can basically uh, exercise, and the faculty of ratiocinatio, reasoning. And this is actually for Vitruvius is fundamentally important. Architecture is not only about building, uh, uh, but it's also about reasoning. It's about organizing mentally and verbally the matter of uh, architecture. And Vitruvius really insists that without uh, ratiocinatio, there is no architecture. Architecture cannot be just fabrica. But at the same time, uh, fabrica, uh, ratiocinatio, in order to become explicable, uh, and representable needs fabrica, needs the practice of building. But I think what is very important to stress is the way Vitruvius really emancipate architecture from just the practice of building uh, and identify ratiocinatio, uh, reasoning, as the very core of architectural uh, knowledge. Of course, um, having defined this set of words, uh, Vitruvius also mentioned those uh, disciplines which at the time were already uh, much more established uh, than architecture, that every uh, architect should uh, basically know, such as, for example, history, uh, philosophy, uh, music, uh, medicine, and law. Now, uh, these disciplines were not uh, mentioned by Vitruvius uh, as a sort of uh, rudimental uh, fair play towards other colleagues uh, busy with other, let's say, uh, matters, uh, but they had a very practical uh, meaning uh, in the practice uh, of, of an architect. History was useful because it was the only way one could understand the customs of a given population and therefore understand the meaning of architectural elements. Uh, philosophy, of course, is a way to uh, exercise, to uh, uh, enforce uh, reasoning, uh, as a sort of way of uh, thinking. Uh, music, of course, is an excuse to be familiar with mathematics and arithmetics, which is, of course, very important in the architectural calculus. And medicine, of course, has to do with uh, knowing that, uh, today we would say, architecture has an ecology. So architecture is not just built matter, but is actually influence, and influence actually a, a much more larger uh, context. And finally, law. An architect has to defend himself uh, from suits, from uh, the accuse of uh, either berbering uh, or not promising through the realized project his own intentions. This was actually one of the reasons why uh, at the time of Vitruvius and even before there were already texts on architecture which were often uh, written not as, uh, let's say, uh, because the, uh, let's say, intellectual interest in architecture, but simply as a defense of architects against patrons or clients that were not uh, eventually satisfied with their own work. So architects were writing memoirs or commentaries or memories of, about what they have done and what were the intentions. And in a way, we can almost speculate that Vitruvius was inspired by this rather fragmented literature to, in fact, compose a final textbook that would in fact, allow the architect to understand what was precisely his own uh, position. Another set of definitions, which I think are very important to understand in order to really, uh, because Vitruvius has a very strong, uh, given very, st like any other writer about architecture, strong importance to words and, and their meaning. And this is actually a very important, uh, uh, I mean, a way through which Vitruvius really manipulates the matter of architecture. A fundamental uh, category uh, that Vitruvio introduced in the, in the first book is the 
concept of ordinatio, uh, ordering, uh, which uh, is, uh, of course, uh, immediately followed by the concept of dispositio. Now, this actually, uh, again, Vitruvio always play with this couple of words. Uh, ordinatio uh, is exactly the scheme, the mental scheme, or the module, or the, if you want, the aiding grill that uh, uh, we need in order to start to design architecture. So every architectural uh, design is always framed by a system of measurements, by a system of proportions, whatever you can think about, uh, without which they can, cannot be uh, uh, designed. So in a way, the uh, uh, ordinatio could be something like this. This is an illustration by Serlio. A grid that architects, for example, at, at this time needs to basically lay down their own uh, design. The second concept is dispositio, which can be, in fact, the analogous uh, in English of design, which is uh, precisely to order things according to a very specific uh, uh, ordinatio. Um, and it's exactly what Vitruvius um, uh, emphasized in the architettura, uh, the idea of, of, of using drawing uh, as a way to design things according to a specific uh, order. Again, here is uh, very interesting, it's very refined the way Vitruvius really emancipate the role of drawing, uh, which as you know by experience, very often has a, its own reality which is reducible to architecture as a building because it implies a set of conventions that one has to apply in order to translate uh, a drawing from building and vice versa. And Vitruvius is full aware of that kind of translation, which is exactly where the architectural idea lies, according to him. Um, and in fact, uh, the uh, design, the act of design, uh, is exactly the crucial moment of making architecture. And design is not building. Uh, we don't have, of course, uh, drawings of antiquity, but already at the time of Vitruvius, drawing, uh, the act of design, uh, plays a very important uh, uh, role. Design actually is divided, disegno, or design, or let's say the act of design is divided in three uh, parts, which are still the convention through which uh, we represent uh, architecture. Uh, Ichnographia, which is, are the plants. Orthographia, which are the elevations. And finally, scenographia, which is the three-dimensional uh, representation. So draw drawing is the materialization of the disposition of the architectural elements. So we can say that together, ordinatio and dispositio coincide with what, in modernity, we would uh, define as parti, which is uh, one of the fundamental categories of architectural uh, design. I mean, the, the whole history of architectural design, not architectural building, but architectural design, which is the translation of built matter into lines, no? into, into two-dimensional projections, uh, can be defined as the logic of the party. And of course, uh, Vitruvius does not use this uh, French uh, word, which would be canonical, uh, especially uh, in the 18th and uh, 19th and 20th century, but he really insists on this. Uh, uh, coupling relationship between ordinatio and, and dispositio. Of course, uh, eurythmia is another fundamental word that uh, uh, which um, Vitruvius used, a Greek word, uh, which uh, is the properness, the beauty, the uh, good shape of the elements uh, in themselves. A fundamental archetype, eurythmia, is the column, which we will see later is a fundamental tool through which Vitruvius constructs uh, his own architecture. The concept of symmetria, very, very important uh, in uh, Vitruvius' discourse, because unlike eurythmia, which is the beauty, or if you want, the properness of the element in itself, uh, symmetria is the commensurability of all the elements together. So symmetria is not what we usually understand, something that has just, uh, 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 it's, it's uh, defined by a central axis, no? Uh, symmetria is the shared measure that different elements have and therefore uh, allow a certain manipulation or a certain design of them according to certain intentions. And, and we'll see that this concept for Vitruvius uh, 
resonates with a particular political uh, project in which Vitruvius happened to, which is a ex rather extraordinary, in which Vitruvius happened to write uh, the Architettura. And of, and of course, the concept of uh, decorum and distributio, decorum of course is the uh, correctness uh, that architecture has to bear vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, its user, and it's interesting that Vitruvius uh, uh, see nature at the very end of the triad that uh, justify the correctness, the decorum of a building. First come function, the user, so something that is profoundly mundane. It's not doing as it should. No, I think it's, a f it's no, fine. No, it's not, it's not for me. It's not for w me, darling. What, what's the problem? We've got to record it, darling. <laughs> it's got to go over here. Come here and swire and you can confirm it. No. No. Yeah, it's now 60 hertz in here. Okay. Try start? Okay, so, um, well, good morning. Um, first of all, I just want to make a small apology for the fact that, uh, as you might hear, uh, the sound over here, uh, my, my computer is, is dying. And, uh, well, I trying my best to resist, uh, sorry, um, to resist uh, the, um, the, the fact that I have to buy a new computer. Uh, but so it's six years old, which I think is a, is a record for, but, um, uh, sorry, I have to. Um, so I, I apologize if something happened we, uh, during my, my lecture. Um, first of all, uh, welcome for, for this uh, seminar, which uh, as you might know from the program, um, attempts to address, uh, uh, let's say, the development of, of architectural theory uh, from uh, Vitruvius to the 20th century uh, by specifically commenting uh, uh, canonical texts that have in fact uh, identified this uh, development. But uh, of course uh, there is a lot of literature on this uh, particular topic, uh, so uh, 
I think you have a lot of possibilities to deepen much more uh, this particular, let's say, subject. Uh, but um, what I would like to do in this seminar is to link uh, this canonical text not only within the Ron discourse, which is of course uh, architecture and eventually town planning, uh, but I would like to connect uh, these books to the particular context, both social and political context in which this uh, uh, text were uh, written, which is something that uh, one often can uh, uh, read uh, in very specific commentaries of these books, but it's not always an obvious, uh, let's say, angle uh, through which to read this, uh, these books. I would like to, uh, let's say, summarize this particular point of view uh, with the Greek word uh, ethos, uh, which is, in my work, my research is a very important uh, keyword, uh, uh, a word that can roughly translated in English as character. Uh, ethos uh, uh, is the character of a given society or a given civilization, the, the customs, the habits uh, that uh, constitute the social and political fabric of a particular period or of a particular, let's say, uh, society. And it's precisely in the ethos uh, that uh, politics uh, reach its utmost, let's say, um, manifestation. So we are very often to see politics in the form of particular symbolic events or in the, in the form of particular symbolic figures or references. But it's uh, much more difficult to recognize politics in the ethos that construct the habits and the customs of the of which we are uh, part. Uh, and I have to say that especially uh, today, especially in the 21st century, politics has to do more with uh, ethos, with the way actually we, uh, in the everyday, we relate to each other than with the representation of politics, which of course we increasingly perceive as something that is uh, outside of our current uh, and more daily preoccupations. Now, I would like to address uh, the problem of architectural theory precisely from this uh, point of view, which is, if you want, more related to our contemporary understanding of politics as, as ethos. Um, of course, uh, for the sake of uh, uh, clarity, I organized the material in a very traditional and, if you want, also very rudimental way by selecting a series of books and presenting them uh, chronologically. So uh, it was uh, very, uh, I have to say, obvious uh, to start with uh, Vitruvius, uh, the Architectura, uh, because actually um, it's uh, perhaps not the first uh, book or the first text that deals with, with architecture as a specific uh, form of knowledge, but uh, for sure is the first systematic uh, book uh, that address uh, architecture, and is of course, as you might all know, uh, the only text that has survived from antiquity that uh, deals directly uh, with architecture. So uh, Vitruvius, whether we like him or not, uh, is uh, the founding father of our discipline. I mean, he's not, of course, the father of architecture as a practice which existed much long before Vitruvius. Vitruvius actually is what has emancipated architecture from the practice, let's say, of building to a form of reasoning, a form of knowledge. And this is exactly what is the ambition of the text that Vitruvius uh, wrote uh, in the 20s, uh, called the Architettura Libridesem, the 10 books on architecture, which really had uh, the ambition to systematize in an almost uh, encyclopedic fashion uh, the knowledge of architecture. And in fact, we can say that uh, we can blame, as many, many uh, architects and researchers have done, Vitruvius to not be really uh, the most fashionable architects. Uh, he, his references are perhaps already at that time he was writing the book quite uh, old. Uh, of course, we can blame Vitruvius to be a very obscure writer at times, especially when he has to deal with technical problems. Um, Alberti, who has written perhaps the most uh, uh, ferocious uh, <laughs> critique of Vitruvius in uh, his uh, attempt to write the 10 books on architecture, De Figadoria, claimed that uh, it was better that Vitruvius had never written a book on architecture. 
uh, because actually instead of clarifying this, he had made even things more uh, confused. But we have to praise Vitruvius for one thing, which I think is very important, uh, and it's precisely his attempt to treat architecture in a radically systematic way. So Vitruvius has really the ambition to uh, address a subject that at that time was, as a, as a knowledge, not as a practice, was pretty much confused. I mean, it was, of course, dealt by very important, uh, uh, let's say, thinkers like Cicero, uh, Varro, who might have the person that has almost invented or made uh, known the term architecture itself. But it was never the subject of a systematic study. And there is an impetus uh, in Vitruvius' style of addressing architecture that is clearly uh, encyclopedic. And in fact, Vitruvius is one of the first uh, writer uh, to really uh, clearly adopt uh, in a very, let's say, radical uh, way this uh, approach to knowledge, which in fact makes uh, the architecture not only interesting for architecture itself, but really as a sort of uh, uh, attempt to systematize uh, knowledge uh, from, of course, the point of view of, of building uh, and, and constructing uh, a place. Uh, and in fact, it's very important to understand, sorry, it's very important to understand uh, uh, the architettura within the concept, the Greek concept of Enchilios uh, Paideia, uh, which is exactly the etymological roots of encyc encyclopedia. Uh, the idea of constructing a text that would be read uh, as a general course uh, on a particular, uh, let's say, uh, set of uh, uh, knowledge, uh, and is exactly what uh, is the very form of uh, the architettura. I mean, the architettura really has this uh, overall encompassing uh, architecture in itself as, as a book, not only for actually the, the subject it. Uh, uh, transmits. Now, uh, this is a very important aspect which I will later on develop and explain why uh, Vitruvius actually felt the urgency to deal uh, with architecture not in an occasional fragmentary way but in such a systematic fashion. Uh, for now, I would like to uh, uh, show you actually uh, the, the, very architecture, the very architecture of the book as an object. This is actually how at Vitruvius times the architectura appeared uh, in the reconstruction made uh, by Indra Cages McEwen, who has written for me one of the most interesting study on uh, Vitruvius, uh, Riding the Body of Architecture, which I strongly recommend you to read as a, after my rather rudimental uh, introduction. She's actually had uh, made a reconstruction um, of the, the way actually the, the books uh, were organized. Uh, Ten books uh, uh, as a very specific uh, meaning. Ten, as Vitruvius also described uh, in his book, is a perfect number. Um, it's, it's a number that has a symmetry uh, in itself. And symmetry, as we will see, is a fundamental concept uh, in Vitruvius' idea of architecture, but also idea of the world. Uh, and for him, is a fundamental instrument to organize things, to give things a cohesive uh, body. Uh, uh, body is a word that uh, Vitruvius stress uh, obsessively uh, in his book, Corpus, uh, uh, which in fact is the fundamental metaphor through which, or if you want analogy, through which actually understand architecture, not as a set of fragmentary, uh, let's say, uh, things, but really as a body, as something that has a fundamental symmetry, like the, the human body, and therefore, through this symmetry, it organized uh, the whole knowledge that we have uh, of the world. And what is interesting uh, is that the appearance itself of the object, uh, the, the, each book, of course, was written in a scroll. And the way, actually, the scrolls are presented, uh, it clearly um, emphasized the concept of symmetry by almost uh, resembling a pediment, which, uh, as you will uh, Vitruvio stress, in architecture is one of the fundamental archetype of symmetry. This is very important in for all the uh, books that we will uh, uh, read. Uh, in, in architecture, but I would say in general, uh, a book uh, should not only be read, but should also be seen. Uh, the book itself is, is an object, uh, is, is, is a form, uh, which cannot be detached from its contents. I mean, one of the fundamental mistakes in reading a book is to disconnect the body of the book uh, from, from its, uh, let's say, uh, content. And in Vitruvius, this is actually very important because, as you see, the very presentation of these 10 books uh, 
stress this uh, sort of symmetry, harmony, between the different subjects, which of course, in Vitruvius, as we'll see, has no a sort of innocent uh, meaning. It's precisely this harmony that, in our own terms, we can almost uh, translate as a sort of overreaching apparatus uh, that is the very political and cultural significance of Vitruvius' attempt to systematize architectural knowledge. Now, of course, uh, we have to immediately, as when we read uh, every book, uh, go through the list of uh, contents. Um, you see uh, how uh, you know, efficiently Vitruvius is able to cover, distribute what uh, he uh, thought were the main uh, topics, the main subjects of uh, an architect uh, expertise. Uh, of course, starting with the very, let's say, uh, basic uh, place uh, of architecture, which is the layout of uh, cities, uh, a practice that uh, in Roman times was of fundamental importance because to found a city, define the start, let's say a city was uh, starting a civilization, starting basically the very ethos of, 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 a, popu of a people that were uh, conquered uh, by the Romans. The Romans really gave to the, the act of foundation, uh, which was a very uh, complex uh, ritual, a fundamental importance and therefore the design of cities was not just the design of uh, infrastructure or of, let's say, the pragmatic needs of a certain place, but it was really the ritual of defining the ethos of a particular c civilization. And therefore, for Vitruvius, is the very beginning of uh, architectural uh, expertise. Of course, after that, uh, he explained building materials. But the most interesting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, one of the most interesting aspects of uh, the Architettura that uh, Vitruvius, uh, and we will see later why, devotes uh, two chapters out of ten to temples, uh, the uh, third and the fourth. Uh, uh, in the third, actually, uh, and the fourth, uh, the, the, uh, the most uh, influential uh, item of, Vitruvius, of Vitruvian theory, especially for Renaissance, is uh, treated, the, the, the orders, what actually later on would be called orders which Vitruvius called uh, types. Uh, and this is actually, again, a very interesting aspect. It's not obvious to, uh, uh, let's say, devote out of uh, 10 books, uh, two books entirely on a specific uh, building, which we will see later has a very strategic importance in the time where Vitruvius was writing uh, the Architettura. Of course, public building, private building, Finishing, I mean, the way actually things are ornamented and, and, and let's say, uh, made uh, inhabitable, uh, where in fact what is interesting that uh, Vitruvius uh, seems to uh, ignore uh, fundamental uh, aspects of that already at that time in Roman architecture were very important, like, for example, vaulting, which is exactly what, uh, what characterized Roman architecture vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, uh, Greek architecture. So, this is something that has uh, always made uh, critics and historians on Vitruvius think that, of course, he has a very uh, retrograde and old-fashioned outlook on architecture. Water, of course, uh, a fundamental uh, element that for Vitruvius, together with fire, constitute the very uh, origin of uh, settling uh, a place. And then one of the two most, uh, uh, let's say, uh, curious, uh, books that, in fact, made Vitruvius' uh, approach to architecture very unique also compared uh, especially to what architectural theory we deal with uh, later. Uh, sundials and clocks, which, uh, as we'll see later, play a very important role, again, in the context in which uh, Vitruvius is writing the Architettura, but it's something that is not, was not obvious that was supposed to be part of the knowledge of uh, an architect. And, of course, uh, machines especially war machines. Vitruvius happened to live, uh, uh, especially at the beginning of his career, in a very special uh, moment of the history of ancient Rome, where, of course, conflict and war uh, was a fundamental, let's say, uh, event. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's uh, known that Vitruvius uh, had served as a soldier uh, together with Caesar. And therefore, he had the uh, direct responsibility in the construction of uh, war uh, machines, uh, especially ballistas and catap catapults. Uh, 
which of course uh, um, in the then book, uh, and it's very interesting that Vitruvius finished the architectura with uh, such a book, a book on warfare, uh, basically with very, very interesting uh, anecdotes, one of which is really the concluding remark of the book and I will explain you uh, at the end. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, the architectura really ends with these two uh, expertise, which of course projects architecture far beyond the scope of edificatio and of course uh, understand architecture within the paradigm of machinatio, of machining things, of machining of, of something that is no longer static but something that has to do with movement and with a very specific, uh, let's say, goal of governing and fighting uh, 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 within, let's say, a very unstable uh, social context. So in, that's very interesting because on one hand we have this strong attempt towards unity and a cohesive uh, framework through which, uh, of which architecture has to be the supreme uh, metaphor. But at the same time, Vitruvius also shows how an aspect of that supreme, uh, uh, let's say, stability is precisely instability, danger, those conditions that characterize precisely the events that uh, uh, Vitruvius uh, uh, describe uh, at the very end of uh, uh, the architectura. I would like now to go through a series of keywords uh, which uh, Vitruvius introduced, especially in the introduction. I mean, Vitruvius has a very, um, he was actually a, a typical style of organizing uh, textbooks, uh, which was to have for each chapter a preface, an introduction, usually the most enjoyable part of the book. And then he would actually, with a series of chapters, deal with more technical issues. And what is interesting about the preface uh, is that they are not uh, immediately uh, introducing the particular topic of each book. Uh, there are usually a general discussion about architecture, so you can almost take all the preface of the books and you will have a kind of general dissertation on, on the meaning of architecture uh, itself. Uh, of course, the most important uh, uh, part is the introduction where uh, Vitruvius, of course, address uh, the Emperor uh, Augustus. Uh, we will see later how this addressing is the very meaning of why Vitruvius uh, uh, brought uh, the Architettura. And, of course, he introduced a series of words, uh, which is very interesting because uh, already at that time, uh, architecture is uh, understood not just as a matter of building, but really as a matter of communication. Of, of, of communicating, transmitting something. And in fact, the first uh, uh, lexical almost clarification that uh, Vitruvius introduced is the difference between signified and signifier. Uh, signified, of course, is the object of inquiry, architecture itself as a, as a building, as a space. Uh, but for Vitruvius, it's also important the role of signifier. He really used these uh, words, uh, of course, in, uh, in Latin which is the terminology that one needs to conduct a proper discussion. So Vitruvius stressed from the very beginning there is no architecture uh, if it's not something that we can speak about. So if there is no a terminology, if we, there is no a, a sort of uh, 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 language uh, framework, architecture itself cannot uh, exist. Uh, Another set of uh, uh, concepts uh, uh, which are very important to understand the very, uh, let's say, uh, object of uh, the architettura is the distinction that uh, Vitruvius made between the concept of fabrica, which is exactly what existed before architecture, the practice of building, which anybody can basically uh, exercise, and the faculty of ratiocinatio, reasoning. And this is actually for Vitruvius is fundamentally important. Architecture is not only about building, uh, but it's also about reasoning. It's about uh, organizing mentally and verbally the matter of uh, architecture. And Vitruvius really insists that without uh, ratiocinatio, there is no architecture. Architecture cannot be just fabrica. But at the same time, uh, fabrica, uh, ratiocinatio, in order to become explicable, uh, and representable needs fabrica, needs the practice of building. But I think what is very important to stress is the way Vitruvius really emancipate architecture from just the practice of building uh, and identify ratiocinatio, uh, reasoning, as the very core of architectural uh, knowledge. 
Of course, um, having defined this set of words, uh, Vitruvius also mentioned those uh, disciplines, which at that time were already uh, much more established uh, than architecture, that every uh, architect should uh, basically know, such as, for example, history, uh, philosophy, uh, music, uh, medicine, and law. Now, uh, these disciplines were not uh, mentioned by Vitruvius uh, as a sort of uh, rudimental uh, fair play towards other colleagues uh, busy with other, let's say, uh, matters, uh, but they had a very practical uh, meaning uh, in the practice uh, of, of an architect. History was useful because it was the only way one could understand the customs of a given population and therefore understand the meaning of architectural elements. Uh, philosophy, of course, is a way to uh, exercise, to uh, uh, enforce uh, reasoning uh, as a sort of way of uh, thinking. Uh, music, of course, is an excuse to be familiar with mathematics and arithmetics, which is, of course, very important in the architectural calculus. And medicine, of course, has to do with uh, knowing that uh, today we would say architecture has an ecology. So architecture is not just built matter, but is actually influence, and influence actually a, a much more larger uh, context. And finally, law. An architect has to defend himself uh, from suits, from uh, the accuse of uh, either berbering uh, or not promising through the realized project his own intentions. This was actually one of the reasons why uh, at the time of Vitruvius and even before, there were already texts on architecture, which were oftly uh, written not as, uh, let's say, uh, because the, uh, uh, let's say, intellectual interest in architecture, but simply as a defense of architects against patrons or clients that were not uh, eventually satisfied with their own work. So architects were writing memoirs uh, or commentaries or memories of, about what they have done and what were the intentions. And in a way, we can almost speculate that Vitruvius was inspired by this rather fragmented literature to, in fact, compose a final textbook that would, in fact, allow the architect to understand what was precisely his own uh, position. Another set of definitions, which I think are very important to understand in order to really, uh, because Vitruvius has a very strong, uh, give a very, st like any other writer about architecture, strong importance to words and, and their meaning. And this is actually a very important, uh, uh, I mean, a way through which Vitruvius really manipulates the matter of architecture. A fundamental uh, category uh, that Vitruvius introduced in the, in the first book is the uh, concept of ordinatio, uh, ordering, uh, which uh, is, uh, of course, uh, immediately followed by the concept of dispositio. Now, this actually, uh, again, Vidrugio always play with this couple of words. Uh. Uh, ordinatio uh, is exactly the scheme, the mental scheme, or the module, or the, if you want, the aiding grill uh, that uh, uh, we need uh, in order to start to design architecture. So every architectural uh, design is always framed uh, by a system of measurements, by a system of proportions, whatever you uh, can think about, uh, without which they can, cannot be uh, uh, designed. So in a way, the uh, 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 ordinatio could be something like this. This is an illustration by Serlio, a grid uh, that architects, for example, at, the, at this time needs to basically lay down their own uh, design. The second concept is dispositio, which can be, in fact, the analogous uh, in English of design, uh, which is uh, precisely to order things according to a very specific uh, 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 ordinatio, um, and is exactly what Vitruvius um, uh, emphasized in the Architettura, uh, the idea of, of, of using drawing uh, uh, as a way to uh, design things according to a specific uh, order. Again, here is uh, very interesting, it's very refined the way Vitruvius really emancipate the role of drawing, uh, which as you know by experience, very often has a, its own reality which is reducible to architecture as a building because it implies a set of conventions that one has to apply uh, 
in order to translate uh, a drawing from building and vice versa. And Vitruvius is fully aware of that kind of translation, which is exactly where the architectural idea lies, according to him. Um, and in fact, uh, the uh, design, the act of design, uh, is exactly the crucial moment of making architecture. And design is not building. Uh, we don't have, of course, uh, drawings of antiquity, but already at the time of Vitruvius drawing, uh, the act of design uh, plays a very important uh, uh, role. Design actually is divided, design or design, or let's say the act of design is divided in three uh, parts, which are still the convention through which uh, we represent uh, architecture. Uh, Ichnographia, which is, are the plants. Orthographia, which are the elevations. And finally, scenographia, which is the three-dimensional uh, representation. So draw drawing is the materialization of the disposition of the architectural elements. So we can say that together, ordinatio and dispositio coincide with what, in modernity, we would uh, define as parti, which is uh, one of the fundamental category of architectural uh, design. I mean, the, the whole history of architectural design, not architectural building, but architectural design, which is the translation of built matter into lines, no? into, into two-dimensional projections, uh, can be defined as the logic of the parti. And of course, uh, Vitruvius does not use this uh, French uh, word, which would be canonical, uh, especially uh, in the 18th and uh, 19th and 20th century, but he really insists on this uh, uh, coupling relationship between ordinatio and, and dispositio. Of course, uh, eurythmia is another fundamental word that uh, uh, which um, Vitruvius used, a Greek word, uh, which uh, is the properness, the beauty, the uh, good shape of the elements uh, in themselves. A fundamental archetype of Rhythmia is the column, which we will see later is a fundamental tool through which Vitruvius constructs uh, his own architecture. The concept of symmetria, very, very important uh, in uh, Vitruvius' discourse, because unlike Eurythmia, which is the beauty, or if you want, the properness of the element in itself, uh, symmetria is the commensurability of all the elements together. So symmetria is not what we usually understand, something that has just, uh, 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 it's, it's uh, defined by a central axis, no? Uh, symmetria is the shared measure that different elements have and therefore uh, allow a certain manipulation or a certain design of them according to certain intentions. And, and we will see that this concept for Vitruvius resonates with a particular political uh, project in which Vitruvius happened to, which is a ex rather extraordinary, in which Vitruvius happened to write uh, the Architettura. And of, and of course, the concept of uh, decorum and distributio. Decorum, of course, is the uh, correctness uh, that architecture has to bear vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, its user. And it's interesting that Vitruvius uh, uh, see nature at the very end of the triad that uh, justify the correctness, the decorum of a building. First come function, the user, so something that is profoundly mundane. And of course, tradition. Uh, a building has to be proper to the specific place, uh, the specific customs. Uh, otherwise, it cannot be used. So it's a very mundane, let's say, interpretation of uh, decorum. And finally, distributes. Of course, the architect has to be knowledgeable about cost and the, uh, let's say, maintenance and the uh, estimation of cost uh, that any architectural building uh, imply. Now, I, I want to now shift to the context in why actually this, uh, let's say, architecture, because we really have to understand uh, the architettura as a project. And this is actually something I will put forward in every session. These are not just books that are simply uh, useful because uh, you might apply this knowledge. You have to understand that every of these writers, and I think Vitruvius in primis, uh, treated uh, writing and the writing of this speci of a specific book as a project in itself, which has a moral and also, in an indirect way, political uh, significance. 
Um, so therefore, we have to understand where these projects uh, were made and why their specific architecture, which I try to describe very rudimentally, resonates uh, with the specific context in which it was uh, built. Um, Vitruvius actually wrote the Architettura at the very end of one of the fundamental uh, events in uh, ancient uh, Roman history, and of course in the history of the Western uh, world, which is the decline, the turmoil of the civil wars, uh, and the decline of the Republic, uh, the very first uh, political form of ancient Rome, and the rise of the empire. Indeed, the 20s, uh, the decade in which uh, Vitruvius write the Architettura, saw the rise of an emperor, a new figure uh, in the political, uh, let's say, order uh, of Rome, uh, rather extraordinary, uh, Augustus, uh, the stepson of uh, Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar actually can be seen, uh, and you know that uh, uh, he would have a rather uh, tragic uh, end of his life, killed uh, because actually he was seen as, as someone who was attempting to, to concentrate all the power of the Republic uh, in his hands. Uh, in fact, Augustus is actually what uh, completes, in a way, the project of uh, Caesar by, in fact, shifting the political form of the ancient Rome from Republic uh, to uh, Empire. Uh, at the beginning of uh, the Architettura, uh, as, you, as I said before, Augustus uh, is addressing the emperor. Um, and in fact, he's saying something very uh, interesting. Uh, he's, this, he's addressing Augustus, uh, the emperor uh, of Rome. Of course, as you know, Augustus is not uh, its uh, real name. The real name is Octavianus. Augustus uh, actually uh, is addressed while he's taking possession of the world. Um, it's a very interesting sentence, uh, which in a way is a very delicate way through which Vitruvius uh, is describing a rather tragic uh, history through which actually Augustus has uh, become emperor, which is precisely the ending of civil wars. Now, you have to understand that in any uh, civilization, there is nothing worse than a civil war, because it's the war where, uh, let's say, uh, the, the winning and the losing uh, uh, cannot be uh, separated into different populations or to different, uh, let's say, opposing point of views, uh, but they happen precisely within the same custom, the same, let's say, uh, people, and the same society. So one of the most, uh, uh, pol uh, one of the utmost political effort uh, is to reconcile uh, a population after uh, a civil war. And in fact, uh, taking possession of the world uh, is a way for Vitruvius to avoid, to tell the, the true story, which is that Augustus uh, uh, is, becomes the emperor to terminate, to impose a pax, to impose a peace, and terminate uh, the civil wars that have, uh, let's say, uh, complicated the history of Rome in the last uh, uh, century uh, uh, before uh, Christ. And in fact, it's very interesting that uh, it's precisely this attempt to reconstruct uh, a society to reconstruct a cohesive uh, uh, body vis-a-vis uh, -vis actually this sort of uh, political uh, collapse that happened uh, during the century that uh, anticipate the rise of Augustus is exactly what uh, the Architettura stands for. The Architettura is one of the first texts, and this is really interesting, and we really have to understand this aspect of this book, written at the very rise of the empire, of the Roman Empire. And it's not a coincidence that Vitruvius felt the urge to propose architecture as a cohesive body of knowledge that eventually encompassed different uh, disciplines and different form of knowledge at the moment in which there is a figure, the emperor, who really tried to uh, address the whole world in a new fashion where in fact the concept of agreement, consensus, organic unity takes a fundamental uh, role. Uh, now, I would like you to just look at this um, very beautiful statue, which is uh, one of the most uh, moving uh, and perhaps radical portraits of this uh, emperor, who you have to understand was the first uh, uh, person to be addressed 
not only with the title, title of emperor, uh, but also with uh, this name uh, Augustus, uh, which has a double almost meaning. It, of course, uh, augere in Latin means to make things grow. And it was a generic uh, title given to uh, things that were very important and precious uh, and have something to do with religion, like, for example, temples. Uh, so it's very new that this, uh, let's say, term is dedicated to a person, to a figure, like uh, uh, Octavianus. Uh, but also uh, uh, Augustus uh, shared the same etymological uh, uh, meaning of auguri, which were the high priests uh, that were responsible to uh, organize the rather eclectic and complex uh, rituals of uh, Roman uh, religion. And in fact, one of the reasons that, have, that historians have put forward why the, Roma, the Republic had fall in decline was precisely the uncontrollable nature of Roman religion that uh, was uh, rather not only uh, complex, but uh, its pantheon was made of uh, divinities that were uh, very often taken from all the places in which the Romans had uh, conquered a particular population. And this actually is exactly one of the fundamental problem of reconstructing uh, the political th strength of Rome is to reorganize its religious uh, organization and one of the fundamental role of the emperor is precisely to be the interface, the unique interface between people and basically the, uh, the uh, in, let's say, Roman um, cult. And this is actually very, very important. Uh, and that's actually why, as you have seen before, Vitruvius uh, devotes two books out of 10 to temples. Temples uh, in the age of Augustus have, uh, of course, uh, a religious uh, role but they also have a strategic uh, public role, which is to reunite, to, uh, let's say, uh, make more cohesive uh, the religious uh, uh, worship, uh, which during the time, the late time of the Republic had completely fragmented. Now, I would like to really uh, make you um, focus on these uh, statues. This is actually the famous uh, statues of August of Prima Porta, which was found in the Livia's uh, villas at Pina Porta. Vil uh, Livia is the very influential wife of Augustus. Uh, it, it might be a copy of uh, an original. Uh, but what is interesting is that uh, the very features of this statue, because they really describe what is at stake, both in Augustus' uh, political leadership, but also in Vitruvius' understanding of this political le leadership and its translation into his uh, book. There are two actually uh, very interesting uh, aspects of these uh, uh, statues. Uh, the first one is that uh, the statue uh, Augustus uh, is, uh, we actually here is uh, portrayed as a soldier with the paludamentum, which was exactly the means of recognition for commander uh, in chief. But uh, what is interesting is that the statue uh, makes the gestures of addressing uh, probably uh, the troops uh, so it's a statue that is speaking, something that is very unique in the uh, iconography of ancient uh, Greek-Roman uh, uh, statues. Uh, statues are perhaps known to have no, the, let's say, the, the word. Uh, they are rather still. Uh, and yet here, the Augustus is speaking, is making the gestures of uh, speaking. Uh, so he's uh, making clear that uh, in his own uh, leadership, uh, logos, uh, in the incarnation of speech, uh, is the most fundamental, uh, let's say, feature, attribute of a new uh, political leadership. He's where he, he wear the, uh, the clothes of a soldier, but is using speech and logos, and therefore ratiocinatio, uh, the reasoning, uh, as the fundamental means of political uh, sovereignty. Another very interesting, and of course, um, what is interesting is that uh, it's, it's that this, um, uh, let's say, uh, way of addressing uh, political readership makes reference to another famous uh, body, which is Polycletus uh, Doriforos, uh, a statue that was uh, made by Polycletus to address the canon of the perfect uh, body a practice that was very diffuse in uh, ancient uh, 
Greek Hellenistic uh, uh, art, uh, the building of certain particular temples or statues that would incarnate the idea of, of, of perfection. The Doriforos was a statue with a, a spear. Uh, and it's interesting that we can say that uh, Augustus statues is a version of the Doriforos without the spear, the symbol of uh, military uh, force, uh, and the replacement with military force with reasoning, with speech. Another interesting details of this statue is the curias. You see that uh, the, 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 in the curias there is a sort of very complex uh, iconographic uh, motif, but the most interesting uh, detail is exactly what happened under uh, the chest. You see uh, someone who is uh, giving back to a Roman soldier, perhaps a general, the famous uh, Roman standards. The standards were the banners, that the Roman legions always uh, carried with the, with the army and in the, let's say, or, uh, Roman uh, Republic and also in the Roman Empire where the utmost, uh, almost uh, physical presence of Rome while the legions were basically conquering uh, a, a foreign uh, uh, population. And uh, this actually uh, gesture of giving back uh, of, uh, of um, uh, these uh, banners refers to a particular event which uh, made uh, Augustus' reputation incredibly uh, crucial for uh, his rise uh, as an emperor, uh, which was actually his uh, uh, recuperation of the banners from the Parthias, a population in the Middle East that have stole these banners during uh, a conflict. Uh, this was really one of the utmost uh, symbolic event that represented the idea of, of defeat. Uh, and what is interesting is that Augusto recuperated these banners, not by uh, war, uh, but by a very clever diplomatic uh, mission. Again, the stress on reasoning uh, as the fundamental way to basically hold uh, and organize uh, power, which is clearly represented in the curias, which, as you know, is the <laughs> dress of uh, a soldier. And this is exactly... Um, the meaning of the architettura. The architettura has to do with this attempt to use reasoning, to use knowledge, not just force and war, as a way to organize uh, power, which of course is embodied in the very body, in the very corpus of the uh, emperor. Another very important aspect of Augustus is exactly because he ends the civil wars and therefore impose what uh, would be called the Pax Romana, um, he is a fundamental promoter of the reconstruction of uh, Rome. And in fact, uh, this is an image of Rome at the time of Augustus. Before Augustus, Rome was concentrated mostly to the, uh, what actually now is the east part of the city. Uh, and of course, a very important spot is the Roman Forum, which is the, the very center of, uh, of Rome. And uh, Augustus would be responsible to extend uh, Rome towards the Campo Marzio, this part of uh, the city, uh, which will become the very monumental uh, center of Rome, the one that will have host all the main uh, monuments, especially those built uh, in stone. And in fact, is known how Augustus, uh, towards the end of his life, said, I received a city made of bricks, and I actually gave it back uh, as a made of stone, which in fact symbolized the specific role of building, of edificatio, as one of the uh, projects through which Augustus reconstructed the, its power. Here you see actually a very important monument uh, built uh, during the time of Augustus, the Octavia uh, Portico, uh, which in fact represents the uh, building renaissance that in fact Vitruvius addressed in his book. I mean, he's writing the Architettura because he sees uh, after this uh, 100 years of uh, civil war, the possibility for architecture to re-civilize uh, almost the city, starting from its spatial, uh, let's say, an architectural organization. But again, um, as in a way um, I've said before, uh, one of the obsessions of Vitruvius' theory is the concept of the body. The body actually, uh, if you take other civilizations' uh, architecture, there is not this kind of rather uh, bizarre no? analogy between body and architecture that has been so important in uh, development of Western architecture. And again, as I said before, uh, 
Vitruvius actually uh, used this analogy of the body to really emphasize the goal, uh, the aspiration to unity that is so important in the uh, architectural project, which, as you have seen, resonates uh, with Augustus' imperium, with the attempt to really uh, uh, pacify and construct uh, the empire, not on the basis of just conflict, but also on the basis of the political reorganization of the entire, let's say, uh, civilization. And of course, the concept of body, uh, the corpus, is a word that, uh, as I said before, Vitruvius repeats uh, many times. Uh, at the beginning of the third book, uh, when Vitruvius actually explained uh, the fundamental characteristics of uh, the orders within, actually, the, his description of temples, he makes this uh, famous uh, description of the human body as a sort of measure, as a reference for the uh, understanding of the integrity of architecture. This is a famous illustration by Cesare Cesariano, who actually uh, will uh, translate, uh, let's say, Vitruvius' uh, man, as, as it's known uh, today, in, in this very famous uh, representation. But again, I really want to stress uh, this aspect of Vitruvius' theory. His reference to the body has nothing of the humanistic uh, overtones that we often read uh, in descriptions of the human scale in relationship to architecture. Uh, uh, Vitruvius' understanding of, of the human body as the very basis of architecture is both much more transcendental. It has to do with this idea of symmetry and unity, of which the human body is the full representation, but also very practical. Uh, in the construction of the new empire, it's very important to stress the idea of a common measure because it's only through the idea of a common measure that this sort of uh, rather complex entity can be uh, established. And of course, this is why uh, proportions plays a fundamental role in Vitruvius' uh, theory. It's uh, just because they are the guarantees, the visual guarantees that um, construction is not just an immanent process, but has its own transcendental value through measures of which the orders, which uh, Vitruvius call uh, types, are the most uh, fundamental representation. And this actually will be one of the legacies that will have a, a, a terrific influence on the development of modern architecture, starting from the 15th century, uh, in which actually the rediscovery of Vitruvius theories will play a fundamental role. But as I said before, a fundamental topic of Vitruvius theory are, on one hand, uh, temples and uh, machines. So two, in a way, antithetical representations of architecture. Again, the temple, uh, as I said before, plays a very important role in the birth of the new empire because it was through the construction of a new religious uh, ethos that uh, the Roman emperor and the empire could reestablish uh, a social and political consensus uh, that was uh, all the time uh, threat by the, uh, let's say, uh, rather eclectic uh, form of r ancient uh, Roman uh, religion. And in fact, as you know, one of the reasons of the decline of the Roman Empire will be precisely the rise of new religions, such as Christianity, which will, from, from within, from the very convictions and habits and customs of the people, from the very roots of the ethos, will in fact fragment and, and destroy the strength of this political, uh, let's say, uh, organization. The other, and of course, the, the Temple of Jupiter, which uh, Augustus uh, reconstructed on the Capitol, really embodies the idea of temple that uh, Vitruvius described in the Architettura, which is still uh, the temple uh, with has, which has nothing to do with the inventiveness uh, and creativity of many other uh, examples of Roman architecture, which Vitruvius does not uh, mention. He mentioned the temple because it's only the temples that embody this analogical, let's say, representation of power through basically its contents, but also through its form, through its perfect uh, uh, symmetry. But of course, the other, uh, let's say, outcome of Vitruvius' um, expertise uh, is his uh, incredible familiarity uh, with uh, machines, uh, and especially with uh, war machines. Vitruvius uh, has a great knowledge uh, he has both design, perhaps, and use uh, ballistas and catapults, 
uh, machines that were the artillery of uh, ancient uh, Greek and Roman uh, warfare. Um, very important, uh, let's say, and very difficult to construct, uh, especially because um, the strength of this machine was not so much in their heaviness of what they were supposed to throw on, but on the, uh, let's say, uh, reliable direction of the, uh, let's say, um, bullets uh, that were supposed to basically thrown against uh, the enemy. Therefore, a machine was a, a great source of engineering inventiveness. And in fact, um, there is a very uh, interesting article uh, by Bernard Cash, one of the founding father of uh, parametric design. I'm sure Bernard will be horrified by this uh, definition of his work, but one of the first to have dealt with, the, uh, with digital architecture in a very, let's say, thorough and, and scholar way, which sees, in fact, Vitruvius' uh, fan book, the last book, as one of the uh, most uh, radical projects in which parametric design is introduced uh, uh, in order to control uh, s an entity that is no longer actually based simply on symmetry and the stability of architecture, but has to do with movement and elasticity, which is a fundamental characteristics of these particular machines. What is interesting is that uh, this, in a way, is the conclusion of the architettura. So the architettura really terminates with the design of uh, these machines. Uh, and actually, the most uh, strange uh, aspect of the book is precisely the conclusion. If you read the last uh, remarks of the architettura, uh, Vitruvius actually um, does not end with the perfection of buildings or machines, uh, but ends with stratagems that have been used by besieged uh, populations, uh, like, for example, Rodinians or the city of uh, Marseille, Massilla, who actually were among the last, uh, especially uh, Marseille, one of the last cities to resist uh, to the, uh, let's say, uh, conquer uh, by the Romans, a free city, uh, which was put under siege by the Romans. Of course, the machines were uh, at the service of the, 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 those who were moving siege against a particular city. But the last, uh, the last uh, part of the, of the book is really on those who are defending their own city. And, and, and Vitruvius actually tells a uh, very, uh, well, not funny, but rather interesting stories about how these besieged people were defending their, uh, let's say, um, let's say their city. This is actually an illustration of the uh, siege of Marseille, where in fact uh, one of the way the Romans would uh, put a city under siege was to dig uh, long tunnels uh, underground in order to surface in the city in the most uh, unexpected way, because of course those who were besieged were locked inside the city and have very limited view of what's happening around their territory. Um, so um, this, uh, b this is a, a technique that the Vitruvius described both in uh, Rodi, in the siege of Rodi and the siege of uh, Marseille. So what the besieged, so those who are fighting in the opposing camp of Vitruvius uh, have uh, d made different stratagems in order to basically fight back this uh, siege. In the first, uh, they deepen um, a moat uh, in order to basically uh, stop the tunnel that is uh, under construction, of, or they build a, a, a sort of uh, beds made of uh, woods, uh, and when the machine is carried on uh, towards actually the city walls, uh, with darts, the, the besieged actually fire this uh, ramp and therefore destroy those machines. Or uh, the most interesting story, which is not uh, shown in these uh, illustrations, is during the, the, the siege of Rodi, when basically, uh, of course, the Romans are still using this technique of digging uh, underground. And it's very interesting that at the end of the 10 books, uh, Vitruvius comes back to the ground. You know? He goes back to underground, so something that has nothing to do with uh, the main, let's say, representation of architecture. So these uh, uh, Roman soldiers are digging this tunnel. The, the people uh, within the, uh, the Rodi are panicking because they don't know where these people will uh, surface. And so they have this idea of, of placing, uh, um, let's say, to make also tunnels inside actually the, the city, place vessels which, uh, of course, when the Romans would approach 
these tunnels built by the siege would start to clang. And therefore, the, the people from Rodi would know from where the Romans are coming. And they would actually uh, thrown inside these uh, tunnels, which of course will uh, connect with the tunnels built by the besieged, uh, either hot water and um, in another occasion, and this is a really funny, uh, Vitruvius mentioned that they throw also human excrement. So they basically uh, overflows uh, the Romans coming from this tunnel with, with shit. So shit is the very final um, scenario of the architettura, which in fact starts with mud, with the very beginning of uh, cities. But um, actually it's a very interesting uh, remark, very strange because in a way Vitruvius ends the architettura, which addressed the emperor with a scene that see the Romans defeated by free people. I mean, Marcel was one of the last uh, free uh, city states uh, fighting against the Romans in the Mediterranean. Uh, but what is even more interesting is that uh, this is an opportunity for Vitruvius to finally stress the fundamental core of architecture, which of course is reasoning, uh, as we have seen uh, uh, before, the art of thinking, of organizing, which is necessary, for example, for the building of temples, but also of machines. But it's also the other uh, aspect is solertia, readiness. Solertia can be translated as deviation from the norm, no? which allows this besiege uh, in this totally chaotic and panic situation to respond and defeat the incredible rationality of the machines that uh, Vitruvius uh, uh, described in the last uh, 10 book. And it's precisely the sort of relationship between ratio uh, and solertia that from Vitruvian on will be the very, let's say, core of any architectural uh, theory and that Vitruvio identified not only as the fundamental core of architectural knowledge, but as the very uh, idea of, uh, let's say, of a political power in which not only the imposition of an order, but also the readiness to constantly understand how whoever is opposing that order would in a way uh, resist or fight back uh, is important in the, let's say, understanding of, a, of the way civilization and the ethos of a civilization is uh, constructed. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know actually if I'm supposed to take questions or, um, I don't know Brett how that works. Uh, two questions, or one. Well, if not, you can prepare the question uh, next time and we can begin with your questions for today. Thank you.